innate trait for anyone or inborn traits that we're born with is the ability to love and the ability to heal. It's not until someone comes in and tells us that we are unlovable or that we're broken, we start to believe that and then we act as such. Hello, sweet ones. Welcome back to Unbroken Chain. I'm Mara James, and this week in Birmingham, Alabama, we get to hang out with Salem Green, who's a beautiful artist and healer who I heard speak and share her writing for the first time at a Quaker meeting house a few weeks ago for a gathering of writers specifically who were working on mass incarceration. And as you'll hear, Salem's work is much bigger than that. Really, she offers writing as a tool for healing and access to selfhood for anybody that needs it, which I would really argue is everybody. But I particularly appreciate her perspective on people who are marginalized in this culture, who have been told that their voice uh, doesn't matter or whose perspectives have been downright oppressed because they're inconvenient to dominant narratives of our institutions. So I really want to uplift the magic of Salem's words and the way that she speaks. I want to tell a little story that I touch on here in this conversation. It happened a couple weeks ago in Montgomery. I went to Lobby Day at the Capitol, which was organized by another social justice group here in Alabama with the intention of mobilizing citizens to go talk to lawmakers in the state capitol and change some of the horrific policies around mass incarceration that exist in Alabama that lead to nonviolent offenders being sentenced to die in prison. And uh, it was really humbling. I've never done that before. I've never gone to speak to my legislators, which is really embarrassing. They are theoretically available to speak to their constituents. But um, one of the people I spoke to was a Democratic state senator who theoretically is on the same page with me about a lot of things. And I went into his office with two other women and with the intention of speaking to him about a particular law and very quickly realized that we were educating him about it. Like we knew more than he did. And I'd really only been armed with a piece of paper that morning telling me about some of the statistics and the fallout from this law. And he had no idea. And he had convictions based on his ignorance that was keeping this injustice in place. So that just blew my mind, first of all, to realize like, oh, these people are just people who've been put in positions of power. And they certainly don't necessarily know more than the average citizen in certain areas where they may not be on a committee. So at the end of the day, we all uh, recircled our wagons and there were some people who'd been blown off by their lawmakers, by their conservative lawmakers who they had voted for in their conservative counties and made to feel like they were underfoot and in the way and, you know, trash people. And it was really interesting, first of all, to see people who had voted for this man reckon with who he actually was as a human being when it came down to being in the same room with him and trying to talk about their incarcerated family member and the direct impact it had on their lives. I think there can be such a disconnect between voting for parties and policies and once again getting in the room with these people and realizing that there are other human beings who may not see their constituents as human beings is really powerful. You know, that family was definitely like, we're not voting for this guy again next time. But Salam was in the room and helping facilitate a group sharing afterward, and her energy was so undeniable. She helped everybody understand what an incredible thing it was that we were all gathered in that room, that the size of the group had turned out, that did turn out that day, and just that having the courage to come and speak about something like an incarcerated family member, to go seek out lawmakers and to share that story without shame is a triumph. She handed that disappointed, defeated family back their agency. It was so beautiful. And that's a really special signal that it carries through all of her work, the right of all of us to speak from a place of truth, no matter the implications that might have on systems around us. 
Your truth is inalienable and there is incredible power and self-making in speaking and standing from that place. And I am so grateful to Salam for blasting that signal out and for her vulnerability in, in sharing what that's done for her own life. And I know it's going to leave you really pumped up about being alive. So here she is, Salam Green. Well, my name is Salam Green, S-A-L-A-A-M. Yes, it, is, it does mean peace. So people are <laughs> like, is it like that word? Like, yeah, it is that word. It is exactly like that word. Um, I am the founder of Literary Healing Arts here in Birmingham, where it's a project that I found to help um, women and all people I work with men as well to use writing as a healing tool. My whole life purpose, I believe right now in this season is to help people use their voices to heal their lives. So I'm a poet, storyteller, healer, creative writer. I'm a teaching artist um, at a few schools here in Birmingham. And I also am an artisan resident for um, University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB. So I go mm. into um, the hospital setting and I do creative writing and poetry with addiction services, um, pregnant women, <laughs> adolescent psychiatry, anyone who needs or wants art as a tool while they're in the hospital to help support their healing and also to help them with their overall experience of being there in the hospital. Wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and thank you for having me. <laughs> I'd love to just explore the idea of writing as a healing tool a little bit. I saw, I think on your website, you had that Hemingway quote about writing about what hurts. Yes. And I really love that because I think it implies this kind of alchemy almost that some kind of transformation takes place so I'd love to hear from your own process or from what you witness with the people you work with what happens and also just what your process looks like yes as a writer a poet I have no process <laughs> I tell people that all the time like what do, how do you get the words out and get them on paper I'm actually a really big hypocrite right 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 but then I go home and I don't you know and um, so it's wherever inspiration may hit me and that kind of thing. But a few um, years ago, I say a few because my memory is fleeting, maybe eight years ago, I started the whole idea around writing to heal. Mm -hmm. I went through a, a really devastating emotional time in my life, a divorce. Um, me and my husband, we served at a church here in Birmingham. So he was a pastor mm -hmm. and I was what they call the first lady um, <laughs> in the black church. And so. Um, we have been doing that for over 14 years and going through that divorce really sent me um, emotionally through a depression and then also identity crisis. Mm -hmm. And for 15 years I was an educator in early childhood education. And so I taught early child education, I was an administrator of programs here in the state of Alabama, the pre-K programs, traveled around the state spoke about how important brain development is in the lives of little children and you know went in the classroom and supported our babies and human development and our families and programmatic structure and wrote grants blah 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 and I was burned out yeah. and went through my own kind of what I call like just a straight nervous breakdown mental breakdown whatever you know is the a correct term mm -hmm. and I found a writing class here in Birmingham and I sat on this lady's red couch for a couple years and I began to write myself back together again. Hmm. I always knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I never had the confidence or the belief that, okay, this can be something that I can be, something I can make money with, or just as a career, as a profession. Hmm. As a little girl, I remember telling my uh, mom, I want to be a writer, I want to be a writer. My mom was a teacher and all the women and um, even men in my life were teachers. And my mom said, no, you're going to be a teacher. And I went ahead and I did that. And I always had in the back of my head, though, that I believe I was called to be some kind of writer and some kind of or journalist or what have you. So being on that lady's red couch healed me and gave me an opportunity to be around other women and community in a village um, where they kind of looked at me and they said, Salem, I think you're a poet. <laughs> like, who's a poet? Who wants to do that? Like, who just like wakes? I mean, there are great poets and great people. But, you know, I'm in my 40s. I can't be a poet. I need like, you know, <laughs> Food, shelter, Alabama power bills paid, you know, clothes, you know, cannot just go out there, you know, under a tree and, you know, sketch nature and start doing this poetry thing. Come on, what's up with y'all? And so, uh, but the more and more I sat on that red couch, the more I began to write and the more I began to find myself 
and mm-hmm. stories that were important to my life. And so that's kind of where writing is for me. It mm-hmm. is an inspiration for stories. And what I help other people do is what writing has done for me. Writing offered me my life back and it offered me a life that I never knew that I could have, but I always believed somewhere deep down inside of my soul was particularly important for me. And I think it also offered me an opportunity to gift that to other folks mm-hmm. who um, maybe not have lost their voice, but maybe would love to use their voice, their own voices, their own stories as a healing tool for their lives. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what writing to heal means to me. It's what I do. Um, it's what I'm doing with mass incarceration and criminal reform or prison abolition work um, as a uh, reimagining justice fellow. I didn't say that in the beginning, but I have a fellowship through the Alabama Justice Initiative where basically women across the state of Alabama who are directly impacted by um, incarceration system and the injustices that are happening in Alabama, we get together and we lobby, uh, we write, we support one another, and we find ways to actually make change and transformation. And my offering to that group is writing. My offering to that group is poetry and speaking and helping other women who, whose husbands are in incarcerated or whose son is incarcerated or you know who are in their community and they see that these things are continuing to happen like how do I allow my voice to go into my local newspaper to my local media how do I allow my face to go out there so other people can see the face or the non-traditional person who's dealing with these issues and so supporting them with writing and supporting them with presentation and supporting them just to know that okay get it out on paper like this sucks this isn't what I expected my life to be you know no one's listening to me right all that down and then come back and then we can see what else we can write on top of that. Hmm. Wow. I relate so much to, I feel like you're speaking to this sense of permission almost like letting ourselves be mm-hmm. artists or be worthy just because we are and we just have our experience can be enough. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you'd speak a little bit to what, what telling our own stories, like what, what does that do? Mm. Well, girl, 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 child, child, child. That's it, girlfriend. It's like when you say worthy. And I don't know that's something that I always, obviously, I do not always feel that worthiness. It's For me, it's not an innate thing that I feel like just is a natural born trait for any of us because of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. But for me, words helped bring me to the place of knowing that I was worthy. Mm -hmm. And my own words and knowing that I had that power inside of me and that other people would listen to me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when I said certain words or when I, you know, uh, wrote something that was impactful. And for me, it has always been an intuitive mm-hmm. writing or intuitive kind of writing. I'm inspired by it, my own intuition, which is my own story. Mm-hmm. And shame tells me, okay, let's not talk about. Okay, you're like, tell me who you really are. <laughs> okay, let me just tell you the bio part of me. You know. I master's degree la 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 no you know okay who wants to hear the continual story of you know the trauma or the continual Mm -hmm. story of you know the thing that took me away from um, a path and brought me on this path Mm -hmm. that kind of thing so story to me is not only we all have a story but we all have a story that uh, I think very well will directly impact the life of others and I think we all have a story that's so valuable that other people will see through our own stories, that they are valuable, that they are worthy, that they are enough. For the woman who is every day sitting at home waiting for her children to come home from school, that's her story, you know? That's her story of, you know, cooking the macaroni and cheese and, you know, fixing the dishes and making sure the home is the way that the home needs to be. Um, That's her story. For the woman who's directly impacted by the incarceration system and knows that every single day that they live in fear for their loved one and not knowing what's going to happen, that woman has a story. And all of our stories collide, you know, Hmm. as women, as men, as brothers and fathers and mothers and sisters, they all collide. And when they collide, I think that's when we all on earth will really face and find that we have more unity than anything else. Hmm. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could we, I'd love to explore the, the mass incarceration component a little bit, because I know you have direct experience with that and, and you also just work with a lot of people in that system. So 
what what does your work look like? There's no oh that's it's crazy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's it's crazy in Alabama and the South <laughs> around mass incarceration. So people who are doing this work, but um, directly impacted my husband uh, spent many many years in prison, um, federal prison and some state prison as well. Um, mental health issues and those kinds of things. So that's my direct impact of living with this every day and understanding way more than I ever wanted to understand. Hmm. It's like, don't tell me anything else. <sighs> yeah, like, thanks a lot. Keep it to yourself, you know. What can I do about it? But, you know, but then at the same time, um, you know how you say, I don't want this to be my story or I don't want to be the face of this. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to know this. I, I want my story to like fit in this nice little pretty box mm -hmm. with this nice little bow, you know, and have this beautiful wrapping around it. I just really don't want this to be my story. And then the universe, or to me, God, or your higher power uh, opens that box up and then bam, that's your story. So there are many women who um, have loved ones and have partners and have people who genuinely are facing these things every single day. And so part of my story is being able to have compassion. Hmm. I don't have answers, I don't have solutions. I don't have a journal prompt or a <laughs> writing prompt. There's no writing prompt for this. You were mass incarceration, there's no writing prompt. But uh, compassion and the hmm. face of what, you know, this might look like when you see directly impacted people. Like let's, you know, really see the face of what that looks like. So my work with working with directly impacted people is all around healing, hmm. restorative justice. Um, before I came into the, um, to doing some of this work, <laughs> more other work that I do is I do restorative justice work in environmental racism in um, Alabama. And as a result of that, then someone called me or something, something, some paper I wrote or something, it was like, okay, can you come over here and write something on restorative justice or healing approaches over here in mass incarceration? Or can you come and talk to us the same way you're talking to this group? So mm -hmm. my work kind of like intersects. Intersection of healing is through every single thing. So when someone's like, pick a uh, social justice reform, like, okay, let's see, what humanitarian things shall I pick? How about like all humanitarian efforts toward all injustices we all stand up for? How, why do I need to pick, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. Every day is different right now in the state of Alabama. Been doing a whole lot of lobbying around mass incarceration, a whole lot of talking with directly impacted people, families, about how they can now lobby for themselves and what they want to tell the legislative government as we're going through our legislative session um, these next couple months. So that's kind of part of what my work looks like. Big part of my work is sitting with people one on one and doing kind of community healing. I'm not a counselor, a social worker, or a therapist, but um, what I do is I help people use writing as a tool to journal what they're feeling. And then also do some restorative circles, what I call community healing circles, where we just sit, sit and we share um, about how whatever's going on. And particularly after the lobby day that we had here in Alabama a couple weeks ago around criminal justice and reform, a lot of people got an opportunity to go talk to um, their representatives and some people did not get a chance to talk to their representatives. Some people got great feedback. Some people got horrible, horrific feedback from people who they put in office and pay their salaries <laughs> to, you know, every single day. And those kinds of things can be very traumatic and triggering. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask people to uh, execute their power. We ask people to use their voice. We ask people to speak up for themselves. And when they do, when you're treated less than a human being or when you are talked down on or when you're looked upon as someone who doesn't understand the system mm -hmm. or what have you, then you go back and you could possibly be defeated. Mm -hmm. My whole thing is like there's no defeat in trying and risking. Mm -hmm. And if someone else treats you uh, badly or their behavior is not according to what their behavior needs to be, that has nothing to do with you. That has absolutely everything to do with them. However, that can be very traumatic and triggering when we're doing this social justice work or when we're doing any kind of abolition or reform work. So when I see that kind of thing, I'm usually asked to go out and do like talking and healing circles and then to remind 
the people who are behind the lawyers and the legal teams, the ACLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center, all these wonderful people who are doing this work. My job is like to remind them, hey guys, this is triggering. I know you guys are lawyers every day. <laughs> you're policy analysts and policy makers. You're grant work writers. You are fundraisers. You guys are behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scenes making sure that this wheel keeps on turning. But hey, mom and daddy just had a triggering experience when they went to their representative. Let's take a minute, let's take a moment to honor that and then to see how our work is reflective in making sure that we don't continue the trauma, the triggering of, 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 the, of the circumstance. What, how can we be more healing in our approaches towards mm. speaking out, lobbying, towards preparing people for what's gonna happen when they do start to use their voice? Mm and to also execute the power that they have inside of them. Mm -hmm. I have to say that was, I learned so much from watching you in that room because there were some people at the end of the day who gave feedback about having really negative experiences and you, you transformed that and just like fed back to them their strength and their worth. And it was really, you had that call back. What did you say? Give them hell, rebel. Yes. <laughs> it just, it, you, it, it was amazing to watch you do that process in the room. Cause it, it would be, I imagine pretty easy to burn out when you're taking on the systems and institutions at the scale that you have to in Alabama. <laughs> Absolutely. And the systems want us to burn out. You know, coming from the whole idea of the systematic racism, the systematic injustice, the whole systems of just trauma and the whole systems of bigotry that we are faced with, it is designed for us to burn out. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, I want everyone to get tired. You can leave me alone. And the three white guys at the front will continue to make the laws because they have, because they are burnt out because hey, they're just sitting here all day, you know, drinking coffee and having all good times and they're getting all the wins and they're, and, you know, no, you know, less stress for them. But the people that are agitating those three white men that are agitating the system that are continue to agitate, agitate the system and continue to um, do all these things, still have to go home and cook for their children, still have to go to their eight hour shift, um, still have to figure out how they're going to get their car working. They're still have their loved one who's incarcerated so having to send the money or having to make sure their, their welfare is still taken care of their life is continuing continuing uh, on the scale that it ha always has been so when we ask someone to take a day off to come and meet with their representative or we ask someone you know to uh, publicly speak about something that is a, an, a, an important thing that we're asking but we also have to take into consideration what we're asking them mm -hmm. to do we also take into consideration they don't do this all day. I do this, you know, this is what I do. You know, this is what I do all day. So there are, you know, ways that I can feel myself back up. But for other people, it's like, no, it's like, look, I'm a welder. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go in here and speak in front of people. Like, look, you know, I'm working with little kids all day. You know, I, I don't work with adults. So I think we have to put everything kind of in perspective to know, like, the dignity that we want to give people when they are executing their power, the dignity we want to give people for the time that they're giving mm -hmm. to speak for themselves and that kind of thing. And um, sometimes, yes, there's a whole lot of transformation that happens, but I hope more so than transformation, I hope that people leave with knowing that whatever they have done has had some kind of value, mm -hmm. whether it's a small win, whether the fact that they just got up and showed up. My whole thing is just show up, mm -hmm. like show up, <laughs> you're mm -hmm. in the room, you know, you're counted among victory already, you know, and victorious folks, you know, that's mm -hmm. part of it, you know. Um, there cannot be a one-sided war. And so in order for us to win this, we need people on both sides of the fence and we need you all to be a front line. And so the front line is here, you know, and that's as, as important as anyone who may actually go out and get anything what they think is done, done, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. Well, I know, I mean, as much as there's a track record of horrific human rights abuses in this part of the world, there's also an incredible track record of people fighting against that. So in your perspective, is this path sustainable? Is this how change happens is by all of us speaking stories? How, how does real change happen? Absolutely. Stories are the way that things are, are going to change. Mm -hmm. My whole thing is the, for the work that I do, I believe in hope and joy. Mm. that we get to create the world we want to live in and we can imagine whatever that is the way that we want to imagine. Now for some people who maybe haven't been, um, haven't used their imagination since they were three years old, you know, because of life or for folks who just use their imagination every day, 
I believe that the way that this war is going to be won or the way that anything is going to be defeated is through joy. Hmm. It's through imagination. And joy is sustainable. <laughs> joy is sustainable. I had a, um, I worked with adolescent psychiatry and I had a 14 year old girl tell me um, a couple days ago when we were talking about goals in life and, you know, oh, what goal in a scientist and, you know, oh my gosh, all these other goals. Like, I want to be a teacher. Oh my gosh, you want to have a family. Just all these goals. And she said, Miss Green, I want to be happy. She said, I think that is a very valuable goal, don't you? <laughs> I'm like, well, thank you. I need to pay you $150 for this counseling session. You know, clearly, I know nothing about anything and what I'm doing. Forget all these other things. Let's forget all this other stuff. Let's just be happy. Hmm. Um, she knew something that most of us, all of us kind of innately know. Uh -huh. You know, when whenever we ask people, you know, from all like 14 to 99, it always ends out to be something to make us happy, you know, and whatever that might look like, you know, if it's playing in the mud, you know, if you're seven years old, if it's 14 years old, you know, learning a new makeup tutorial on YouTube, if it's, you know, 20 years old, you know, going out there and learning the technology skill and that kind of thing, or if it's a 99 year old who's like, you know, mm -hmm. telling their significant other, I love you, or if it's drinking tea around a table with new friends, you know, it's like, that's what brings us joy. That's what's sustainable. And so to help people who are fighting, to support people who are fighting, to come alongside people who are fighting, and to kind of give that additive of joy, of imagination, like you get to reimagine what justice looks like. That's what Latanya Tate, who's the executive director of the Alabama Justice Initiative, who is a, a part of the fellowship I'm part of, reason she named it Reimagine is like, you get to imagine what the justice system looks like in Alabama. Like we have the power, but we also have the joy and the imagination to do that, mm. you know, around any type of systematic issues that are happening here in the South by uh, people going out every single day, voicing their opinion, protesting, marching. This is what the landscape of what we have been given, the blueprint of change. I, um, a couple of weeks ago, PEN America was here and they have a fellowship called Writers for Justice. So all of the writers for justice from across the nation were here in Birmingham. And the first thing they all said is like, why should we come to Birmingham? Like three were from New York, one from Texas, someone was from, you know, the Dominican Republic. I mean, everybody was not from the South, like zero people from the South. I'm like, okay, you should not object to my application, but that, okay, I'm, I'm okay now. <laughs> I'm okay now, I try not to hold a grudge, you know. <laughs> Another thing about writers and poets, we get rejected every single day for everything. But anyway, they were here and the first thing they said is why Birmingham? And as I was talking to those fellows, the first thing they talked about was Martin Luther King and talking about his writings from, you know, a Birmingham jail. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> why are you here? So the, the, the foundation for the work that you're doing, you know, is Martin Luther King. The foundation for the work that you're doing is from, you know, um, Southern abolitionists. The foundation for the work that you're doing is from folks who've been working towards, you know, abolishing racism and institutions that are surrounding, you know, inhumane conditions. And where has that started? Who gave you the blueprint to do that? The blueprint came out of the civil rights movement, came out of the Jim Crow era. We don't have to do any other thing to make any other changes. If we take the blueprint of what those people who were in the civil rights movement have done, what our fathers and what our mothers have done, then we have the blueprint for change. It is no different. Their blueprint was okay. We're gonna march from Selma to Montgomery, 54 to 55 miles. And when we march, we're gonna sing, we're gonna have joy, <laughs> you know? And then we're going to protest. We're going to say what it is that we want. So we're going to give them some direct action. And after that, we're going to get, give them a speech. And then we're going to write that speech. And we're going to send that speech to other people so that they can read. And we're going to get media and other folks to hear us and bring that out. So that's the blueprint of change. And then we can even go back even further to, you know, what we've seen our ancestors do uh, in, in Africa or African ancestry. Or we can even go even further to indigenous uh, folks you know, who we have totally stolen every single thing from. The blueprint of joy, the blueprint of abolition, the blueprint of land and food and family and tradition and culture. 
that's what saves, saved their life. It wasn't that someone came and said, okay, we want to give you a better life. It's like, no, I'm gonna have to reimagine and create that life for my family. And I'm gonna have to use my culture. I'm gonna have to use the joy of what I've been taught to do that. And then I'm gonna also fight you so that you don't take this away from me like you took that away from me, that kind of thing. So I think we have the blueprint. No one has to change it. Nobody's changing it. We just continue to kind of march forward and we remember and honor our indigenous brothers and sisters. We remember and we honor our African brothers and sisters. We remember and we honor those who abolished slavery, not um, Abraham Lincoln, you know? <laughs> no, but we remember and we honor, you know, folks who in Jim Crow era and a civil rights um, era as well. And we come here so that we can see that, oh, this is it. Mm. You know, when they were saying, you know, we're walking down the street and we see the statue or we see the side of the building where, you know, people were, you know, killed or people were hosed. And it's like, this is real. I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. it's real and it's triggering. And imagine being an African-American person or a black person every single day and, you know, having to walk past some of these things, but also look at it a different way. The hope and the celebration that we have of the recovery and the restoration we have a lot of work to be done, but we also have a lot of celebration that we can do mm -hmm. around this new world that we can imagine that we are creating for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I know I talk too much. <laughs> no. I'm like, okay, so why? It's so infectious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up feeling connected to that lineage? I grew up in rural Alabama. Greensboro, Alabama, Hill County is maybe two hours from here. So that's south. Maybe it's an hour and a half from Montgomery. And my grandparents grew, grew up in a place called Snow Hill, which is Wilcox County, which is one of the poorest counties in the nation. Wow. Sharecroppers, the whole kind of what you can imagine. And we, we were maybe 30 minutes from Selma. So every weekend, that's how we got our groceries. <laughs> I mean, Selma was going to town, so you had to go to town. And my grandfather had the first store as a black man in Wilcox County. And so he would have to go to Selma to get his, you know, cigars and chips and beer and all that stuff, you know, for the store. And so he would take me, I have two brothers, so he'd take us to wow. Selma. And, uh, you know, we had to go downtown to Golden Flake or what have you, or to Miller Lite or whatever was down there, you know, to the candy store, you know, who didn't want to go to the candy store and the cookie store, get your $5 lemon cookies and your oh. penny cent, you know, coconut long boys and, you know, all those like now laters candy and stuff like we had. So. I grew up not knowing that I lived in poverty. No, I, my, my mother, like I said, was a teacher. So even that, you know, whatever we call middle class isn't middle class for all classes. But I grew up um, knowing Selma, knowing Montgomery. I think one of the first times that I remember seeing a protest was in Selma. I was maybe four or five or five or six. And um, they were protesting one of the uh, pharmacies downtown Selma at the time, which was a bustling downtown. And as I was going, watching my mother getting ready to go in and get a prescription for my grandmother, there were these black people in circles with afros and, you know, picket signs and, you know, saying whatever they were saying, a refrain and what have you. And I remember being a little self at that time and my brothers being little too. And my brother just automatically ran into the pharmacy like, okay, you know, cause this is where we go. And there was this big man, you know, this Afro and this leather jacket who stopped him and he said, hey, we're protesting the pharmacy. You know, we don't go in there as black folks. You know, they're not being good to us. They're not being nice to us. And my mom was like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't give him a chance. And then I remember my mom explaining to me that that was a protest, that those women and men were marching because there was some injustice or whatever had happened in that pharmacy, uh, black people weren't allowed or black people weren't getting treated right. Mm -hmm. And so I remember just at that age, you know, <laughs> seeing, <laughs> seeing those big feet with my little eyes, you know, just going around in a circle in front of our pharmacy, you know, where we go, when we got the prescriptions every Saturday and wondering why I couldn't go in there to get my penny candy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and why were these people so loud? And what did this really mean on the sidewalk in Selma mm -hmm. that day? And I realized now what that meant, you know, the sidewalk in Selma. But that's kind of where my family always grew up, a you know, very political family, talked about politics kind of thing a lot. Um, like I said, we lived in that era. Um, uh, Dr. Doc, Dr. Scott, which is Coretta Scott King's brother, would sit with my mother on the porch every mm. evening and, and Sunday and talk um, 
probably not talk good talk, but talk a bunch of stuff, you know, and I would be like next to the window listening to him talk about a little bit about church, you know, God. And then he would talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the civil rights stuff. And then he would be, then I would hear him say something about there are bad people who are doing these kinds of things. And then they would then go back and they would talk about church and stuff like that. So I grew up with these figures, you know, sitting on the front porch and, you know, rural Alabama kind of you know, at the time just being like people, you know, like preachers or whatever, and, you know, not really realizing at the time, like the significance of those conversations or the significance of being a kind of an ear smuggling <laughs> smuggler, you know, and also not realizing just the opportunity of being in a household of people who, you know, were politically inclined and who also were about social justice and faith and that kind of thing. Wow. Wow. So you touched on sort of the the not good things that he might have been talking about. And I want to ask you, especially as somebody that has experience working in restorative justice, because you are so positive, how do you how do you think about and and how do you talk about, you know, people on who, who are on the other side of the battle, people who are oppressors? Like what what do you how do we humanize them and also combat the harm that they're creating? Absolutely. So um, you don't know me very well by saying I'm a positive person. No. <laughs> I'm very negative, Nelly. I hate it here. No, <laughs> no. Um, I believe that with the work that I'm doing, that just having to make myself feel joy, because if mm-hmm. not, you know, <laughs> but one of the things I'm very honest. Mm-hmm. And so I was a couple of weeks ago, Bib and Tucker, which is a, a, a quilting guild here in Birmingham, which you all should really know about, they had the Lynch Quilt Project is going on. So the, there's a Lynch Quilt um, showing of Lynch Quilts here as well. What is a Lynch Quilt? Um, of people who have been lynched uh-huh. and people do a quilt uh-huh. of the lynching wow. or a representation of the lynching. And so LaShonda Crow, who is a nationwide um, expert in lynching and an academic in lynching, was here and did a two-day workshop on lynching and a whole healing approach around lynching. And I know, it's like, okay, let's not... (laughs) We need that. (laughs) We need that. And then, you know, and and, and it's an honest, total honest approach to it as well. And part of her approach is finding her own joy inside of her, which really resonated Mm -hmm. with me. It's like, okay, every day I I cannot imagine with her working as an academic who teaches, you know history and lynching and then works in her community having the den to then you know go home and be upset and be mad like how do we find ourselves in that Mm -hmm. while at the same time the reality like this sucks you know I hate white people Mm -hmm. you know I really hate white people you know it's like no I really do get out of you know and I have those moments and I've said that to to many white people but she did a great storytelling uh, time in this workshop and we got a chance to kind of write our trauma out and then after writing our trauma out, kind of share it. And I was there with some of the people I work with and I kind of said, you know, the whole trauma of being the only black person in the room sometimes mm-hmm. or being the only black woman at work or being the only black woman here. Because in Birmingham, you're working in a social justice area and you see yourself in a, with a whole maybe diverse folks. But if any day, if you just go around Birmingham, you're probably like, hmm, that's just, this is just, this city is not, it's a little different than I thought it was, you know? Oh, okay, where the black folks at, you know? If you're just walking downtown or if you're having dinner in some of the places people may suggest you have dinner in or if you're just kind of going to some of the museums and events, it's like, whoa, you know, 70% black, but everything is, you know, so I find myself, you know, being in those circumstances and having to say, okay, how do I not, how do I not lose it? Mm-hmm mentally you know knowing i have issues with depression and mental my own mental health issues and i have a directly impacted person who has mental health issues and i am the caretaker and caregiver in all these other areas Mm -hmm. so it's really for me i have been finding that peace and my peace is riding and walking Hmm. you know walk try to walk every day (laughs) you know and nature with no one around where no one needs to know where i go and writing and telling the whole truth about it you know the the truth from every single thing that um, I experience as a black woman here and then everything that I see other people experiencing where they might not feel confident or comfortable mm-hmm. and telling the uncomfortable truth mm-hmm. is as a human being I don't hate you but the incidents of what you represent mm-hmm. have not been healed mm-hmm. not just for me but have not been healed from a community of folks that's not my responsibility 
That's yours. My responsibility is to tell you, guys, you're not healing. <laughs> you're hurting and harming. And then to go back and go for my walk, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and to feed myself and to be good to myself and to go to, you know, my people and have joy and music and, you know, my, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of how I compartmentalize it. You know, for me, there are other people who do great jobs at educating folks on racism and injustice and those kinds of things. I'm not the I'm not the one to call if you want me to go to a group of white people and say, OK, can you tell us about racism and education and educators on that? They're, I, I can give you someone to call. <laughs> I'm the one that will come and tell you about the joy of black people and the joy in our community and how we are keeping that joy up regardless of what you do or don't do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious in, in the, the people that you're working with and helping them, you know, have the confidence to stand in their voice. Do you see some common experiences or, or common ways that, that people think of themselves that need to be liberated? First of all, that word, thank you, liberation mm -hmm. <laughs> versus, you know, a lot of times we, we um, for me, if it's not centering liberation, the whole idea behind Freedom is that we're liberated not just from the incident, but we're liberating ourselves from the whole idea of what that incident may have done to us or may have done to someone else, you know, that kind of thing. I think, liber first of all, helping people to see that liberation is a important value, but also you're worthy of liberation. Like, that whole worthiness of, for so long, uh, I, I did a podcast called The Ugly Truth a couple weeks ago, and they're a great group of people, and we talked about um, how some white people don't understand racism and, and different communities here in Birmingham and these kinds of things. And um, a lot of people may live on, you know, in a part of town who haven't even gone to another part of town that's maybe like five seconds away or five minutes away and have no idea about the type of poverty and marginalization or just people. You know, this is not, not poverty and marginalization, it's just people. You know, everybody, has, that there's another part of town, you know, there's another group of folks, there's another stuff going on other than over here on the mountain. And, um, and in doing that podcast, I began to see that there were some common themes that you know, we all have when it comes to our lives. When I'm doing healing work or when I'm out there speaking, number one, we all wanna be happy. Hmm. And, we already, and we already know, like we already know what makes us happy. Hmm. Whenever I do writing and any type of writing prompt, I always say that you know how to heal yourself. Hmm. We were born knowing how to heal ourselves. Think about a baby. When a baby's hungry, his stomach is not going to stay tight from that hunger for too long. It's going to do what? Cry out for help, right? <laughs> Cry out for that uh, substance, that, uh, substance that they need. You know, when a seven-year-old is riding their bike and they fall off their bike and, you know, they scrape their knee, they're going to hold on to that knee because that's where that scar is. And they're going to keep coming back to that scar until somebody puts alcohol and a bandage on it. I know how to heal myself, you know? So we all have been born. Innate, an innate trait for anyone, or inborn traits that we're born with is the ability to love and the ability to heal. It's not until someone comes in and tells us that we are unlovable or that we're broken, we start to believe that, and then we act as such. Our role is to, and this is my brain development years and years, you just teach brain development <laughs> with kids, uh, for early childhood, is that we, you know, we, we can rewire those thoughts. Just like trauma changes the wiring in our brains, the dendrites in our brains, happiness and joy rewires that back to where it needs to be. So the more tra traumatic and triggering experiences that we give ourselves, then all of a sudden the serotonin changes and our chemical, ch chemical brain chemi chemistry changes and those chemicals in our bodies changes. And then the rewiring of our brain changes over time as a result of drugs or abuse or molestation or what have you, those kinds of things. However, we have a malleable brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people say you're hard headed. No, your head is soft, <laughs> softer than most people want to admit. And we can rewire it by giving it the opposite kind of experiences. Walking, doesn't matter what it is. Like some people, yes, can go to expensive counseling and do talk therapy. Great way to rewire it. Please do that. Other people, walking. Mm -hmm. Sunshine, vitamin D. Particularly for African-American people because we need more vitamin D. So sometimes, oftentimes, tell them, go out there and get some vitamin D. You know, whatever that may be, is that we have the ability to 
rewire our brains through thoughts and joy and create different experiences that change that brain chemistry and that serotonin level. Yes, some of it may be chemical. We might need a chemical to help support us. For others, it might be environmental. We might need some environmental support. For others, it may be support from family or finding a new family you know, or new friends or what have you. But it's possible. And I think part of my role, and I hope with the role of everyone who works in these spaces would be, is to help support other people in doing that, as we do that for ourselves mm -hmm. um, as well. Whenever I hear someone say, someone says, oh, that triggered me. Like every, yes, I mean, everything in the world will trigger you <laughs> because it's just how, you know, poor this life, you know, and it's real. And the reason why it feels real is because we haven't now put a new rewind of the brain of that particular trigger. You know, like I remember my brother, he, he pushed me down an escalator, right? The top of the, it's not just like the little escalator, like, you know, the top, like big part of the escalator, you know, and forever I was afraid of the escalator and people were like, oh, you're afraid. I'm like, escalators are mean and bad. People die and they really do. I mean, it's, they're worse than y'all know in the world. So go and research escalator deaths and then you would never get on another escalator. But anyway, you know, so forever, you know, I mean, the whole idea of just passing by an escalator, like what triggered me or heightened my stress and, or made me remember that experience. Or even if I forgot the experience, I couldn't even remember why, like, why can't I just like, or if I'm at the airport or something, you know, it's like really embarrassing. Like, it's a bunch of people and I was like, oh, 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 go, go. Okay, okay, you know, I'm gonna go, you know, kind of thing. So um, it wasn't until I just started to realize, like, I need to give myself a new experience around an escalator. Like I had just a bad experience, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, let me give myself a happier experience. Let me go one day when the escalator is clear, <laughs> the mall is empty, <laughs> not a lot of people gonna, no little kids behind me, you know, <laughs> they're gonna push me down. <laughs> later. My shoes are tied, you know, I'm going to wear Velcro, so I have to worry about getting, you know, caught up in there. And, and by the way, that you can turn the escalator off on the side. I got all the research behind how not to down an escalator. But, you know, to give myself a new experience around it and to just say, okay, I'm going to go, go. Instead of going down, I'm going to go up and build my confidence and then I'll go back down and just like spend a day or ride in the escalator. Just something that's very silly and seems, you know, so that's an example of just how now, it's not my most favorite thing to do. I still remember that memory, mm -hmm. but I can laugh through that memory. Mm -hmm. Where before, I could feel myself become anxious or triggered or someone would say, you know, we're gonna go to Mall of America. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they might have, they've got some really high escalators there. I can't go, I can't go. You know, I can now say, hmm, you know, I can breathe through it. My brain does no, no longer is wired to think that escalator means death. That escalator means you have enough confidence to like ride it and then get off of it and go on to your next day. So hopefully with social justice work or any of this justice work that we're doing, you know, particularly working with returning citizens who have been a part of the mass incarceration and justice system, uh, any of those kinds of things, so just do those, those kind of little pieces of work with them, particularly like if we're gonna go back into a school building that may remind you of like, Going to school building is very anxiety ridden for most po people. And to remind them like, this is why you feel some anxiousness around getting your degree or going back to this, you know, program. It's like, feels like school. It's big, you know, and you may, and how was your experience there? And then how can we now rewire your brain or rewire your thoughts or you have a different experience and allow that experience to now be the catapult to towards where you go in the future mm -hmm, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is such powerful work because I mean, as you said before, I think a lot of these institutions are designed to make us feel not enough so that we're dependent on them, yes. which I feel like is really, we've been talking about this a lot lately because so many conversations these days are about mental health. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that are working on different pockets of that, like working with kids in school, working with veterans, working with people in mass incarceration, which is really valuable and we need people to do that. But I also have the sense that like, everybody has the same problem, which is that culture is just like stealing people's ability to, to heal themselves, like you're saying, or, the, or their own strength. And um, yeah, I feel like what you're speaking to is it's, that's how you subvert that because the institutions and the culture aren't going to, their prerogative will remain. And so it's really like the internal work to reclaim that, that, that has to happen. Yes, and it's grief. I think what we call, what I call, a lot of people call sadness and what may truly be mental health issues and depression is grief. And behind sad, there's mad. 
mm. oftentimes tell people, you know, that behind and behind that anger is grief. Something we lost or didn't get or that died or that we killed, whatever, you know, mm. and have not, and have not now healed that grief in particularly. And there's that anger that's masking itself as this deep pockets of sadness and what we may, we may call depression. And, just, and if it is depression, then the chemical of continually being sad then causes a chemical you know, in our body or if we even may be born that way because we talk about you know, babies who are born into stressful environments because of the grief of their mother or poverty of their mother or the lack of men, uh, medical care for that mother. So that baby now has that chemical response to the chemicals of their mother. So then now their brain is formulated to have, you know, a more depressive state than they would have if they would have had a more positive maturation. All that kind of stuff is true. And so what I help people with is to recognize where the grief is. Like, where's the, tr where's the root? Like, we're sitting underneath the tree. Sap is just like, Fallen off this tree. It's just so much sap. Like this tree, you know, I know it's a hundred year old tree, but where is so much sap coming off of the tree? Okay, put your hand down underneath the, the leaves, underneath the sap, you know, underneath the rocks, underneath the straw, underneath all of that. And what do you feel? You know, you feel the soil, you know, and if you put it down a little bit further, you might even be able to reach the hard part of that. Like, you know, so a lot of times we're just doing the surface, which is just the soft part of everything. And we're just like attending to the sap, attending to that. And it's a hard part that's underneath that root, you know, that we have to t finally touch. Mm. And OK, was it, you know, a, a neonatal issue where, you know, we know what a lot of mothers go through? You know, was it drugs or was it something that you did, you know, that you that caused a trauma in your life? So to help people with that grief and to call it what it is, because like you said, we all, life is shitty, right? <laughs> Don't watch this kids. Watch your kids, watch it. You should say that word. They know what it means. You know, it's, it is. And problems happen all the time. And then learning how to be problem solvers mm -hmm. of our own problems, that's a tool that we are, 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 that's a tool that we ought to learn. And sometimes grief stops us you know, from going to the next level of it, you know, and that grief can easily turn into a mental anguish and mental anguish can turn into depression and depression, you know, um, you know, uh, bipolar and, you know, it's a trauma induced mental illness, you know, and some even being born, you know, there's some trauma in birth, that could be it, you know, or it could be anything in lack of nutrition, that's trauma, you know, all of those types of things are trauma induced things that we have to deal with, you know, and we can mask them, but at the same time, do we, how do we talk about it and honestly say, okay, you know, we don't want to just use that word trauma as like a catchphrase for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to look at the healing in the root. So then we can just start solving these everyday problems. Mm -hmm. like you can't shit on people with your triggers all day long. Mm -hmm. Just really can't. You know, you just, I mean, I mean, you know, if you want to have healthy relationships and work and live and be happy and to get to the success, like we all want to be happy. OK, let's see how we can deal with our own triggers or find ways in which that we can be more compassionate with ourselves and more loving with ourselves um, so that we can help support ourselves. And then once we do that, then we have more confidence that, yes, I was born, you know, for this and born to do this. And I see these examples of other people around me who are doing that. That's what support groups do. They give us that support we need. So sometimes we might need to get in a community of people mm -hmm. to say, I need your strength right now. I need your hope right now. I need your experience right now until then I can then now hold on and hone into what I innately already have. Do you feel like as a woman in particular that you were given the tools to deal with negative, I'm using air quotes, emotions like <laughs> anger or grief? Do, do you feel like you had to learn permission to go into those? <sighs> As a woman, I, no. I mean, growing up in the South, it was like, be nice, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or um, this quintessential, you know, quiet person, always like, because I'm very loud, so be quiet, don't mm -hmm. speak loud. I mean, loud like my voice, you know, mm -hmm. just like as some people, just louder than other people. So it's like, close the door, you're too loud, you know. W girls are, or women, we, we're not loud and those kinds of things. So I am just now, I think, getting into the place, and I struggle with this. I, I I'm, tell people, like, I'm, vulnerability is the most important thing to me and I struggle with vulnerability and to tell the absolute truth about who I am in the best way that I can, particularly if it's in a harm-free, harm safer environment 
or a brave environment is I still have a hard time with feeling guilt when I'm angry or when I'm mad or transferring it away from, you know, mad and anger and just saying, I'm just sad, you know, or I'm just depressed or, and not, and pe not in a lazy fair way that there's no such thing as depression, but just, just say, okay, I'm just sad, you know, kind of thing. So the permission I give myself to be like mad as hell about things and not really care if people think that I'm a loud black woman who has an attitude, you know, <laughs> because that's the second thing I get is like, oh, Salam, now you have an attitude, you know, it's like, if I disagree with you, no, I do not, I just don't, I like what you said, you know, that, that, ma that made me mad, I don't have an attitude or anything, it's just a natural emotion called anger, you know, <laughs> it's like, now I might have an attitude, baby, but, and so what if I did, you know, but that, but then it gives a neg con negative connotation and a uh -huh. stereotype about women, then the stereotype about black women, then the stereotype about southern black women. <sighs> so my whole thing is like, when can we like come to term? When can I as a woman, you know, choose? Like I can choose to come to terms with my own identity and my own self, my own personality. Like I can make this choice. This is who I am. Like I am a raging introvert when I do not have to go out in public and I just feel shame about the fact that people call me. It's like, why aren't you here? I'm like, what? I'm here. Why would I be there? You know, come on. You know me by now. I'm eating. That's what I'm doing all day long until I have to go somewhere, you know, and give myself permission to just be me. Like, to, like you mentioned before, just to be like, just to like, not a, not a human doing, but a human being. Like, this is just a being like I'm sitting under the tree, you know, I have my hand in the soil underneath the hard part of the rock, you know, I'm asking nature and the soil to speak to me so I can listen about what my next path mm. is. Like, I don't want to burn out, like you said, or be mm. sad or any of those kinds of things. So as a woman, I wasn't, my mother was a teacher, my father was a teacher, and my grandfather was a principal of the school. So mm -hmm. at the school, you know, any problems, you know, there were no problems. So I was taught just a certain way to act, a certain way to be, um, after my mom and dad divorced, my father uh, was a, a drug addict and he's in his 70s now who's in a reha rehabilitation program uh, for probably for the rest of his life as a result of drugs and what it has done to his life. But one of the most brilliant, smartest man, men in the world who had mental health issues and <sighs> didn't hit that soil, you know, <laughs> didn't hit that hard part of the rock, you know, and is now just not doing that in his 70s. You know, I was taught shame and to feel guilt and to allow that whole thing to rewire my brain towards depression and not to get help or ask for help. And so, no, yeah, it's just now as an adult, well, adult, adult, you know, because I'm a middle age, middle age woman, oh my gosh, you know, midlife, where I'm just like, oh, maybe I should give myself permission just to like, be mad, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You wrote a really beautiful essay about your 40s. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd share a little bit about, yeah, what this time, what is midlife for you? Yes. Um, I think when I turned 40, that was very liberating. Like, you know, people always would tell you, I mean, I, I never was that dramatic person. Like, oh, my God, I'm turning 40 or I'm turning 35 or I'm turning 20, 20 uh, 30. Like, I didn't get it. Like, like, guys, you know, you're still young. You know, what is up? You know, and I hear young, young people who are younger than me now, you know, particularly women who are like, oh, my gosh, I'm 31. I guess I'll just like, you guess what? You're 31. You're not supposed to have anything. You know, what you want? You know, this kind of thing. My life it didn't pan out the way I wanted it to be. You know, <laughs> your life has not happened yet. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so when I turned 40, I just had this really um, great kind of epiphany where like I d did feel like I came into my identity of, not that I didn't care about what other people thought, but it's just a whole different thing. We, and that's why I, I, you won't understand until you get there. <laughs> You've got a piece to go, girlfriend. But when you get there, you're going to be like, oh, that's what Salon was talking about. It's like nothing changed in my life. Bank account, still, you know, in the negative, you know, <laughs> no new friends, you know, love life about the same, all of the things the same, but it's just something that changed about life in the 40s as far as my outlook on who I was. Like, I finally can say, I know who I am. Do I always walk in that? No, but when I find myself kind of veering off the path, I'm like, wait a minute, you know who you are. Mm. Or if someone tells me, oh, you insecure, or somebody tries to like, talk down to me or, you know, or if I'm in a relationship and something happens, it's like, hmm, almost got me. <laughs> I'm 
I'm almost low. But I know who I am, even if I don't act it, act it out all the time, you know, and innately, I'm just so sure of myself more so than I was before. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, I look forward to that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I wonder if you have any last um, sort of vision that you would like to share for the world or for yourself or your community, but where you, where you use your imagination to, to point us ahead. Oh, I think I would just want people to know that they can create the life for themselves, that they can imagine. And if people are out there saying, well, I can't imagine it, there are people who can imagine it as a result of marginalization and poverty and all of these like terms and co- ways that we coin people. The first thing I would say is let all that go. Mm-hmm. And letting go doesn't mean that it's some type of like veil thing that you just like let go and, and still don't have emotions around. Mm-hmm. For me, letting go is I don't, I don't, I will not believe what you say about me or us or whoever the them is. Like, I don't believe that. You know, when I work with kids in what they call the inner city or whatever, like, this is not the inner city. These are, you know, fourth graders. And that's that, you know, (laughs) who are just like fourth graders, you know. (laughs) These are eight-year-olds. These are nine-year-olds. So um, don't believe the story that somebody else is trying to print about you. You get to create what your own story is. And it can be dramatic, it can be melodramatic, you know, it can be full of splendor, it can be an extroverted journey, you know, it can be of you totally reimagining what who you are and just tomorrow jumping into that as if you like were not the same person you were yesterday and just like change your clothes and change your hair and just be that, you know. You have not just permission, but you have the right to imagine. And then after imagining, creating. And after creating, being. Do not believe the story that you cannot use your imagination. The thing we were born with. We were born as creators to develop and to design. We were given dominion of this earth. Every single thing on it, plants, uh, birds, animals, everything that's here, food. Just like you make that wonderful meal every single day, you can do the same thing for your life. No matter who you are, where you are, and whatever you have been given or not given, do not believe the story that it's not enough or that it cannot be enough or that poverty and marginalization or stereotypes or some other trope that people have determined is wrong is something that is gonna allow you to stop and to quit. So that's what I would tell people, like you, your imagination is your imagination and your story, you can write it. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you so much. If people wanna connect with you, where, where could they find you? You can find me, um, Salam Green, S-A-L-A-A-M Green. Um, my website is The Literary Healing Arts, thelitraryhealingarts.com. And I'm on social media, Instagram, Salem Green, Facebook, Salem Green, Twitter, Salem Green One. Um, and my business is The Literary Healing Arts on Instagram. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here again today. I love seeing the things that you all are working on and the ways that the compassion that you're showing yourself is glowing out into the world. We need all of you and I'm so grateful that you are showing up. If you want to find me online, you can always find me on Instagram at Mara James. And on my website, I have some new offerings up, marajames.com slash healing. I have felt a call for a minute now to offer my own healing tools to the world to share the things that have helped me, um, many of which I've talked about on this podcast. And I resisted for a long time putting out this signal because I thought just because I know how to work with my own mind doesn't mean that I'm any kind of expert on anyone else's experience. But I think more and more I'm understanding that a lot of the things that I've grappled with, disconnection, addiction, 
plant medicine and integration of the sometimes really challenging lessons and gifts that have come from that, boundary navigations in relationships with parents and romantic partners, learning to see the underlying programming of my own brain and waking up to the belief systems that are driving my actions so that I can write better narratives and scripts that serve me, learning to connect with ancestors, honoring my intuition, tending wounds of manipulation, gaslighting, control, and just dealing with the crazy making of being alive in this culture right now, navigating late stage capitalism and colonizer culture and realizing the ways in which we are victims and also perpetrators of that <laughs> and waking up to our own agency. You know, these are, these are things that I understand that many people are grappling with right now. And if there's anything that I've been learning from these teachers that I've spoken with on this podcast, it's that the gifts of our self-healing are our gifts to humanity, to the world. And I'm at that stage that Anais Nin speaks about where it's more painful to remain the seed than to sprout. So I'm opening myself to anyone that wants to walk this path with me that would like to connect with me as just another voice in the process of transformation and growth. Somebody that can help ground explorations of inner experience and practice vulnerability and authenticity. A, a big gift that I got from plant medicines was a decision to stop being different people to different people and in different environments, which freed me from having to construct myself according to my surroundings and has also just helped me feel a sense of overall like health and connectedness and greater ability to stand in myself even in situations that are uncomfortable and challenging. It's one of my favorite things to do through this podcast and really in all of my relationships to reflect back the strength and beauty and wisdom that I see in everyone. Really so much of my healing journey has been falling back in love with the world and stepping into what Salam speaks about, the, the creative force that I felt so in touch with as a child and realizing that becoming an adult does not mean we have to put away that magic, but is actually an invitation into mastering it. So for anyone that's curious to learn more, I have some things up on my website and I'd be happy to talk more in depth if you wanna shoot me a message. I want to leave you with a poem of Salam's, which is called 3,659 Days. I heard her read this poem the first time I met her uh, last month in Birmingham, and it shook me to my core. I hope when this podcast is over, you'll find 20 or 30 minutes to sit down in a quiet place and pull out a piece of paper and let whatever wants to come out, come out of you choose to give it space and choose to accept whatever comes out it'll only get better from there more soon this piece is 3659 days lord have mercy i watched a grown man slowly lose his life once i walked him in the unit marked don't pass by here without a proper ID. I bent down and pulled up his shorts, put dignity in his pockets and love in his heart, leaving him far away from the cell he lived in for 3,659 days, 3,659 days, 3,659 days. Lord have mercy. Y'all sitting around this table have no idea what I went through. Yeah, yeah, I, I know you can only assume. From all these pills stacked up here, there's Respinol and Prozac and a lower tab. But for 3,659 days, 3,659 days, no one shook my hand, kissed my forehead, 
led me to the promised land. Unless by the promised land you mean over there, way over there, 3,659 days, 3,659 days, and no one, not no one, shook my hand.